Hello and welcome to this week's devlog for my procedurally generated voxel based RPG game. This is a game where I attempt to distill my favourite bits of a large scale RPG game down into something that fits well onto a mobile device. Minus the hyper realistic graphics after all, as this is just a solo project. I am but a man. I make a devlog each week so you get regularly exposed to my face as well as the inner workings of my mind. Last week I did a load of technical wizardry in order to get my train chunked for performance reasons, improved a number of things in my editor tools and also suffered a hangover on the Friday. After having to crunch out the video on the Sunday while also in a bit of a compromised state, I decided that this week I needed a bit of a chill week. But that's not to say that I didn't get anything done, oh no as I mostly just focused on whatever features needed to be implemented to improve what I had thus far. However, the video still needed a thumbnail, oh so I decided, at the same time, I would implement something that I saved for a week where nothing interesting really happened. Behold the ultimate power! Shadows. Yes, and I saved this for such a long time because I knew that in my engine, all you really had to do to get Shadows working was just edit a text file a little bit. So it didn't even take that much work, but it does look cool. Now I did actually do that work on the Thursday, but as it's the main topic of this video, I'll just start with it now. Shadows in the real world are just the absence of light, but calculating them in real time graphics is kind of difficult. My engine uses Ogre3D for graphics and like any real time graphics engine, it has support for shadows built right in. You tell it how to render the shadows with its built in compositor system and then it has a few different examples of how you can set that up. You can get some really quite complex shadows but for the purposes of this game alone I really wanted to stick with something quite simple. This game is meant to run on mobile remember so I do actually have to be quite careful about performance. Rendering shadows is an extremely complex process as you actually have to render the scene twice in order to figure out which objects are actually in shadow. You have to completely render the scene once for each light that you intend to actually be casting shadows as that is how you determine which objects actually obfuscate the light. So what I've decided to do here is probably the simplest approach you can take. I only want one light to be casting shadows and that is again for performance reasons and that one light is going to be the directional light which is what essentially is meant to be the sun in the scene. I modified my compositor file in the appropriate way in order to get it to start rendering the shadow map and then if we check inside the graphics debugger we can actually see what the shadow map looks like. So it's really just a simple depth map but that's really all we need to do in order to tell which bits are in shadow. Obviously you can cut lots of corners when rendering this thing, you don't have to texture things or apply the pixel shaders to them and you can also avoid other things like you can use lower resolution models. I don't do any of that here but you can do it. So here is what it looks like when it's actually running inside the game. So there are a few improvements that can be made to this straight away. The first one being that the terrain objects themselves are actually being rendered as part of the shadow map, meaning that they're considered to be casting shadows. We don't actually need this because obviously they're the ground, they don't need to cast shadows. And we can see in the graphics debugger that it is going through the individual steps of rendering these things again, which will be a massive slowdown. Luckily, it's a fairly common task if you want to actually exclude something from the shadow map render. So I just had to expose this single function to the script API to allow the engine to be able to be told that items shouldn't cast a shadow. And as a result, you can see the updated shadow map in this case where the terrain chunks are not being rendered. I think the scene will look cooler when I've got actual more stuff in the test scene. Um, and also here is what it looks like when running in the overworld, which is where the gameplay really takes place. So now with basic shadow support in place, I wanted to try and experiment with doing something even cooler with them. Have you ever heard of these things called clouds? A series I've always quite liked is the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games, especially the older ones, they're pretty fun. When you're walking around the towns in those games, the game has these pretty dramatic cloud effects which I do think add quite a lot of atmosphere to the game. And it's pretty impressive when you consider that this thing is running on the Game Boy Advance. I really felt like that helped sell the aesthetic of the natural environment, so I decided I would try it out for myself. So I made this quick cloud model in Blender just to test the theory out and got it into the game. I created this class to manage the cloud animations just so that it could be reused in the different worlds. So it didn't really take much code before I had some nice animated clouds floating over the top of the sea. You can see the effect of the shadow that they cast on the terrain and I think that looks really nice. 
Uh, the thing was, I wasn't actually expecting that the clouds would be visible in the final thing. So, I did some render queue magic to figure out how to stop rendering the clouds, but also still keep rendering the shadows. And you can see that here. This sort of gives the impression that the clouds are sort of far off into the sky. I began experimenting with the scale of the clouds a bit, just to try and get the effect fully shown. And then, I realised that I had been a moron. So, this is a game about voxels, i.e. everything is square. So, why are the clouds round? So I made this replacement cloud in my voxel editor just to see what it looked like. I think it looked quite interesting, although I definitely intend in future I'll probably have a bit of variation just to help break it up. I mean, it fits the aesthetic, but I also don't think it's really in a like production ready state yet. So I'll come back to that one later. For now though, it really just demonstrates the idea. And truth be told, there's all sorts of things I could do with this. I could potentially make the directional light sort of animate around the terrain itself to kind of give the impression of a day-night cycle. I also applied the clouds to the overworld scene just so you can kind of get an impression of what that looks like. And I do think it looks quite interesting. So I'm happy with how it turned out. So with the shadow epidemic out of the way, here's what else I did this week. One of the things that I was actually missing in my level editor was the ability to actually save your edited terrain. I mean, I guess you need that, don't you? This is a level editor that I had to build specifically for this project and this game. So I don't actually really intend to spend too much time on it. It doesn't have to be amazing. But that's not to say that I don't need the ability to save the map, obviously. But as I've written this editor, I've also had to add support for more niche things to my engine, such as the ability to write and read XML files, the sort of more complex scripting functionality, and as of recently, the ability to actually write files to the disk. Wait, you mean I didn't have that already? Okay, well, yes, turns out I didn't have support for writing files to the disk, but there is a pretty good reason for that. The thing was that I was reluctant to add a lot of these features because I knew that there was a possibility that these things could be quite easily abused. The engine was written in a way that project files could be changed quite easily, as everything is ultimately just written in plain text. That, of course, is intended to make things easy for stuff like modding games. But when you include support for modding games, you also open the door for potential bad actors. You might do things like sprinkle in a little bit of file system abuse here and there. You know, just a little bit. If the engine only really facilitates reading from the disk, then you have way less potential to break things. However, it was clear that some concessions were going to have to be made. So I think the plan was that I would have a difference between the release and development builds of the engine. Development builds have way more features, but are also far less secure. They are generally slower as they do do more sanity checks, but really they're just there to let the user develop things. They do offer more features anyway, such as unit test projects, a proper physics visualization system, and a script debugger, among other things. But one of the decisions I made going forwards was that I'll only allow full file system access to the developer builds of the engine. So really that is there to help facilitate the development of tools, which is essentially what I'm trying to do. Release builds have as much stuff stripped out as possible, in order to make the engine run as fast as possible, uh, but also more securely. The only place where release builds will be able to write unencumbered will be the saves directory, which is just a designated place where the project obviously needs to be able to save certain files as part of the save system, so it can do whatever it wants there. That's the plan. Other than that, it will be as locked down as possible in order to help avoid many of those security issues. Right now though, none of those checks are actually implemented, although I hope they will be at some point in future hopefully by the end of the year. So with that preamble out of the way, I set about being able to write things to a file using my already existing file class, which was previously just used to read things. This wasn't really so bad as all I ultimately had to do was just piggyback off the top of C++'s fstream class. Now I had the ability to splunge out a file, I decided that I would update my terrain tool with the ability to write the terrain data. I don't really know why I had to say that because that was the obvious next step. I could now make an edit in the scene editor and finally see it reflected in the actual game, which was really cool. And I would just like to remind you, please do not pay too much attention to this terrain shadows issues. It is unrelated and will be fixed at some point later. I just haven't really had the time yet. With that, I ceremoniously threw out everything related to the old terrain system as now I had no use for it. I did want to do some work with some general improvements now. So one of the first things I did was fix an issue where if you click the edit button, it would sometimes crash. This was because the UI wasn't actually consuming the input and ultimately it was just performing a terrain edit. So I moved some of the code around to get it to not trigger anything when the mouse is in a sort of compromised position. Secondly, I added something that I should probably have had there from the beginning, which was the ability to paint on the terrain itself. 
Now, if you remember how voxels actually work, I'm not really painting as much as I am just replacing the voxels that existed there previously. My code was um, a little bit hacked in, so I did have to change some of it around. But I eventually had the ability to paint on the train and also added a few buttons to be able to switch between a few modes. But now began the worst bug of the week and it cost me a day. For some reason, when I was writing the voxel colors, there was a little bit of garbage data that was getting appended at the end. I had no idea why this was actually happening and most of my time spent trying to fix it was just me trying to figure out why it was actually doing it in the first place. I eventually made the realization that if I just use a single character to represent the voxel colors, then the problem didn't actually occur, which told me it was either something to do with file size or just issues with writing strings. See, previously the way that I was actually writing the string to the file was that I just had this function, which would take a string and just dump it into a file. So my original concern was that maybe there was some limit on how big strings could actually be in Squirrel, which is the scripting language I'm using, and maybe that was causing some issues. So to fix that, I also added this function, which allows you to write a single line to the file at a time, and it didn't fix it. Something that I did learn was that if I just deleted the file first, then the problem just wouldn't occur at all, which was strange. I clearly didn't understand something about the C++ Fstream API, and not to mention the fact that the function which was appending the lines to the file, in theory, should have just grown the file each time you saved it, but that didn't really happen, and I didn't understand why, because the thing was you could read the file in at the other end and it would still look fine, so that didn't make any sense. I could see from the console prints that the values I was writing were correct, and if I also added some nonsense at the end of the file, in theory it should have crashed it, but ultimately it didn't, and that was even more perplexing. But after a while, I just decided that I was wasting my time, so I went with a file deletion solution. This was generally quite frustrating, but you know, whatever. I, as much as I want to understand what everything is doing under the hood, I am really on quite a tight time budget for this. So if that fixes it, and it's an editor tool that doesn't have to be perfect, well, whatever. It's probably good practice just to delete the file up front anyway, but I just didn't understand like why all those things couldn't just coexist, so eh. And to be honest, I spent quite a bit of time this week just dealing with annoying issues with the editor, which is why I had to crack out the shadow thing that I've been saving for quite a while. Like this one, where you edit the position of an object and it ends up in the wrong position when you save it. Or this one, where painting colours actually just paints voxels. Hooray! Anyway, I did manage to fix both of those things, they were just a few examples of stuff I had to deal with this week, but you know how it is. Game dev is hard. According to my calculations, we only have 21 weeks left in the year, so I'm interested to see what sort of product I'll be able to deliver by the end of the year, but if you're interested to see that, then I guess you better subscribe. Outro. <laughs>